Hello, this is Richard Collins, your instructor in ATM 101, Weather and Climate of Alaska, here at the University of Alaska, Fairbanks. Welcome to our Unit 4 tutorial on interpreting weather maps and satellite images. The goal of this tutorial is to get you started on using weather maps and satellite images in your investigation in Unit 4. The goal is not that you become a complete expert. The idea is that in getting started your expertise will grow through the semester as we cover more in-depth material in the course relating to um, weather maps and weather mapping and forecasting. So initially the tutorial is to support you in getting started and in using um, surface weather maps and in using satellite images to make statements about the weather that you're seeing at your location and placing the weather that you see in your location in a regional and global context. Surface maps show the weather patterns based on surface pressure. The map uses pressure contours like topographical maps use elevation contours and the map is based on observations from a network of weather stations. Just as in a topographical map, we have elevation contours and then we have mountains and valleys sitting in that pattern of elevation contours. So in surface weather maps, we have high and low pressure systems sitting in the valleys and peaks, if you will, of the um, pressure contours. The geos Stationary operational environmental satellites goes look down on the Earth in different wavelengths. If you will, they're looking at the Earth in different colors. Each color is an individual channel. And so in this investigation, we focus on three channels. The visible channel, where we're looking at the sunlight reflected from the Earth and atmosphere back to space. This is the view we would see if we were just looking down on the Earth ourselves. The temperature channel, which is looking at 10.7 microns, this is the wavelength associated with the emission of heat from the Earth at a temperature of about 300 Kelvin. If we go back to the Wien displacement law, this is um, the peak wavelength we expect for emission at terrestrial temperatures. You see that this wavelength is nearly 15 times longer than the visible wavelength of 0.65 microns that's used in the visible channel. We also note that the visible channel is using a wavelength close to the peak emission of sunlight at about 0.5 microns. And finally we use the water vapor channel at 6.5 or 6.7 micrometers to look out specifically the structure of water vapor in the atmosphere. This is a wavelength that is very precisely tied to very strong emission um, of radiation by water vapor. It's relatively unique to water vapor and it allows us to track water vapor in the atmosphere. That water vapor at any terrestrial temperature will glow very brightly at this specific wavelength. So we'll start by looking at a surface weather map. This map represents the weather map produced by the National Weather Service in Anchorage for today's weather on August 27, 2012. The map is actually a composite of the surface weather map with surface weather symbols and then a false color black and white cloud cover a map based on infrared satellite information. So we're going to start with just the discussion of the surface weather map features. We'll talk about the infrared and satellite information later in the tutorial. So we start with the fact that we've got pressure contours here at standard levels. The thin black lines are lines of constant pressure and we have constant pressure levels from 1024 millibars to 1,020 millibars, 1,016 millibars, 1,012, 1,008, 1,004, and I think you'll find contours if you follow them down as far as 1,000 millibars on this map. So there's a range of about 24 millibars between the highest contour levels and the lowest contour levels um, on the map. We then see that we have embedded in those contours are centers of high and low pressure. The single high pressure on the map today is at 1,024 millibars, sitting inside the 1,024 millibar contour. 
and this is an area of high pressure with a central size of several hundred miles. We then have seven low pressure systems. I had to count them for a minute. Um, we have what I'd say are three distinct low pressure systems. One over Siberia at a thousand millibars surrounded by the 1004 millibar contour. A low pressure system in south central Alaska at 1004 millibars very close to the 1004 millibar contour and a low pressure system in south eastern Gulf of Alaska just off the coast at 1010 millibars just inside of 1012 millibar contour. There are four weak low pressure systems sitting over northern Alaska and in the Arctic Ocean and this is a relatively complicated picture of highs and lows. It's not the simple textbook picture that you'll see in um, textbook analyses of forecasting and synoptic scale weather systems. But it is real. It's the weather for this day, August 27, 2012. The next feature that jumps out at us is the warm and cold fronts. Warm fronts are where warmer air is overtaking cold air and pushing up against it and the direction of motion is in the direction of the um, semicircles. So if I look at the warm front um, just south of the Aleutians, this is warm air pushing north from the Pacific into the Bering Sea. Cold fronts are the blue lines which are moving in the direction of their arrows. If I look again at the high pressure system in the Aleutians, I see a cold front to the east of it where cold air is pushing down out of the Bering Sea across the Aleutians into the North Pacific. And this is consistent with the pattern we expect around a high pressure system. Around a high pressure system in the Northern Hemisphere we have clockwise circulation of air. So we have on the western side the air should be moving northward, on the eastern side the air should be moving southward and so Warm air is moving northward on the western side, cold air is moving southward on the eastern side, and so the high, the high pressure system fits with the pattern of the warm front and cold front in this case. The low pressure system in south central Alaska is sitting embedded in two cold fronts where cold air is moving um, from Alaska in the northwest down into the Gulf of Alaska in the southeast. The low pressure system in Siberia looks like a small textbook system. Air around a low pressure system tends to circulate in a counterclockwise direction in the northern hemisphere. And so in this case we expect that the warm front and the cold front will pivot in a counterclockwise direction and so we have warm air coming up from the North Pacific um, into the Bering Sea region behind the warm front. We have cold air coming down out of Siberia into the North Pacific behind the cold front and the occluded front represents the fact that the cold front has begun to overrun the warm front at the northern um, end of the system. Down in the south eastern Gulf of Alaska we have an occluded front around the low pressure system. We also see where there is weather where we're defining weather as where we have um, precipitation and so in front of the cold front in Siberia we have fog and rain. We have some fog and rain and drizzle um, in front of the warm front in the a Bering Sea and along the cold front in Alaska we go from rain to moderate rain which is heavier than rain um, over Alaska and up on the north slope we have a mix of fog, drizzle and rain associated with the weak low pressure systems up there. We also have a pattern of clear skies in northwestern Canada that we'll discuss also. We now move to looking at the visible satellite image. 
So this is the visible satellite image corresponding to the same time that the surface map was created at 10 a.m. Alaska Standard Time on August 27th. And the, this represents the sunlight reflected from the ground in clouds. It's the view we would see in black and white if we were just looking down on the Earth from space. And we first of all see that in the Western Pacific and in Siberia, the visible image doesn't tell us that much because the sun hasn't risen on that part of the Earth yet, and therefore we're not going to see a lot of detail. And this is the great limitation of um, visible satellite imagery, that it only works during the day. So let's focus on what we see over Alaska, Canada, and the Gulf of Alaska. So in region B, we see clear skies to the southeast of the Alaska Peninsula and Aleutians, and then we see clouds um, to the further southeast. In region C in south central Alaska, we see lots of bright white cloud. In region D over northern Alaska, we see a mix of cloud, some of it quite bright, but we also see down to the ground in the darker locations. In E, we're seeing all the way down to the ground in Canada. And in F, we're seeing bright white broken cloud over the um, southern Gulf of Alaska, northern Pacific. So this is the view of just all clouds. It doesn't tell us what the clouds are doing. It tells us where the sky is clear and cloudy, but it doesn't tell us anything about the altitude distribution of the clouds or the likelihood of precipitation. So let's move on and look at the first of the infrared satellite images, the thermal image at 10.7 microns. So now we're looking at the first of the infrared images, the thermal image. We're looking at the corresponding locations in the thermal image. And we start with B, where under clear skies to the southeast of the Alaska Peninsula, we are seeing the warmest temperatures, um, gray-black. And then as we move southeast into the clouds, we see lighter grays associated with the clouds being at higher altitudes in the troposphere than the ocean surface. And therefore, they are at cooler temperatures because in the troposphere, the temperature decreases with height. In C, over South Central Alaska, we're now seeing details that we didn't necessarily see in the visual image. We're seeing a variety of whites and grays indicating that we have local regions where we have clouds extending high in the atmosphere and regions where there is a lower level cloud. That there's a mix of high level and low level cloud. In region D, we're seeing the same type of, of new detail. We're seeing down to the ground, but we're also seeing a mix of warm and cold temperatures associated with um, upper level clouds and lower level clouds in the troposphere. In E, we're seeing our darkest colors where the ground is being heated in the mid-afternoon. Remember in Canada, it's later in the day than over central Alaska, to, um, Canada being to the east of central Alaska. And so we're seeing the solar heating under clear skies in the mid-afternoon and the warmest temperatures on the, the image. Under F, we're seeing a uniform gray. We saw a lot of structure in the visible image, and now we're seeing a more uniform gray that says we would have intermediate temperatures, not the high cloud temperatures and not the surface temperatures, but something intermediate. And I'll come back to that analysis when we look at water vapor. There is something a little different happening here that we'll talk about. And at G, we're seeing the same pattern in as in B, we're seeing cold temperatures near the ocean surface and then a band of cloud to the southeast at colder temperatures. Um, G and B are similar situations where we had cold fronts in the um, surface weather map and this pattern of clear skies and clouds, clear skies behind the cold front and clouds at the cold front. We move to our second infrared image, which is the water vapor image. And the first thing to point out is we see that water vapor isn't smeared out uniformly. There are real distinct re dry regions embedded in moist regions, the dry regions being the dark um, black regions embedded in the moist regions. This map is over a wider area than the other maps, so we've had to rescale our sizes a little bit, but I've marked the common areas.
And so in B, we see that there's a dry region over the uh, Alaska Peninsula and a moist region associated with the clouds to the southeast of the Alaska Peninsula. The in C and D, our moistest regions are associated with those places where the clouds were coldest in the previous image and that indicates that we have moisture associated with the deepest clouds that extend to the highest altitudes. In E, we see that there's a dry slot through that clear region in Canada. Those clear skies are associated with dry air. And then in F, we see that we don't have much moisture. And this may be confusing because we saw a very bright cloud in the visible, but we don't see a lot of moisture. And so the reason for this is as follows. When we look down from space, we see all the infrared light coming toward us. In regions D and C, where we have thick cloud, we're seeing cloud tops. But in region F, we're seeing cirrus clouds. You notice that back in the visible image, we, there was a lot of structure to those bright clouds and some brokenness to it. And these are thin ice crystal clouds sitting at the top of the troposphere. They're very cold, but they're also wispy. So when we look at them in the infrared thermal image, we don't necessarily see that they're cold because there's also radiation coming up from the ground or the ocean surface through this region. And so we're seeing a combination of surface radiation and cloud radiation, which gives us the gray color in the thermal image. And in the water vapor image, we're not seeing a lot of water vapor. These are not thick water vapor clouds. These are thin ice crystal clouds. So the interpretation around cirrus clouds um, requires extra thought. And finally, in G, we're seeing the same pattern of moisture um, as we see in B, associated with the low pressure system over Siberia. So, in summary, what I want to point out is the use of the three satellite images to provide a more complete picture of what's happening in terms of clouds, cloud height, and water vapor. The issue in water vapor here is that where the water vapor is at the highest concentrations where we see the brightest white water vapor image. We are seeing the regions where we get the most precipitation. Precipitation is more likely where we have more water vapor. And so that's what the water vapor gives us is not just that we have thick cloud cover, but we also have a chance to look at um, where precipitation might occur. And in using the three images, we can distinguish between clouds that are very bright in the visible that are thick clouds that are giving us precipitation and very bright clouds like cirrus clouds that are thin ice crystal clouds that are not associated with precipitation.